So, I remember in high school, distinctively, uh, one of our friends came into the library. We were studying uh, for the regents. I think it was the physics regents. It was, it was pretty interesting. And she came in and she ran in. There were like six, seven of us there. And she, were like, she was like, guys, guys, you won't believe it. And we're like, what? She was one of those like real perky types. And uh, she came in and she had a ring. Like, like this one, but it was gold. And you know everybody, and she was like, you know, my boyfriend got me a ring, and the rings were big, and like, in the in the early mid '90s, you know, people would give rings to each other, and you know, if you it was a symbol of you know, I don't know, crazy love or whatever it was. And we were there looking at this thing, and she was like, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it nice? And one of the girls was like, is it real? She was like, I can't believe you said that. How dare you? How dare you ask if this is real gold? And I was just like, well, maybe because he's like 16 and he has no money. <laughs> and she was like, he saved up. And we're like, oh, whatever. And so we went back studying. And just, you know, three weeks later, um, she didn't have the ring anymore. So I was like, did you break up? And she goes, no, but I'm about to. I'm like, why? And, and her, her finger was green. I was like, why is your finger green? She's like, I want to talk about it, Sam. You know, she kind of blew me away. And um, I found that later, I, so I, you know, I researched it. We didn't have internet yet. So, um, you know, and I asked around, and so people, people told me, you know, when the temperature rises, and basically you can really test the purity and the integrity of the metal, especially if it's gold, you know, gold doesn't turn green, it doesn't change color. And, it te the, when, when the temperature rises, it, it changes color. And just like that, people's true, true colors show up in life when what? When the temperature rises. I mean, anyone, everyone can be poised and cool, you know, and elegant and awesome looking. And you know the makeup is perfect, but when the temperature rises, all that stuff begins to show. And you know, the truth is, you really can tell the integrity and, and the purity of someone's character, someone's real self in crisis. It's only in moments of crisis get to really see who you really are or who other people are. Their true colors show. And today, I want to talk to you about this chapter we're on. We're on Exodus 17. And last week we talked about how there are always people, the people of God, the Israelites, the Jews, they're always repeating these patterns. But when you really think about, let's go to the passage here. The very beginning place when, look, look at this, I don't have to look back, I have iPad right here. Yeah. <laughs> this is not mine, but if anyone wants to get it for me, yeah, you're welcome to. I'm, not, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, when you go to this passage, it's a mirror of when your true colors show, when the temperature rises in times of crisis, you see the people of God only about you know three months before leaving the land of Egypt from the grip of Pharaoh, being free and leaving the land, going to the land of the promised land. God's leading them. And you see all these crises happen. And if you, you know, if you really think about it, if you want to see someone at their worst, just, just go in a van when it's hot. I mean, you want to kill people. You think like other people smell. <laughs> That's probably because they do. But, you know, and you, everybody just gets annoying. You want to punch someone in the face sometimes. I mean... Maybe that's just me. But maybe that's because the temperature rises, things come out of me. But it's interesting that the first verse of 17 says that the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin. I'm not sure if Moses was intentional, but I guess the desert's name was really sin. And um, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. And you can see geographically that the promised land would only really take 40 days 
to cross. You know, where Israel would be in the Middle East. But they circled on for 40 years, and God, it says that God led them. Right? you got to catch that. It says that God led them from place to place. And where does he take them? He takes them to the desert, where the temperature is really what? It's hot. Where the temperature rose. Where many crises would take place, and their character, and their true colors would show. And one of the, I think, greatest reasons, and the most powerful thing about the gospel, is that it doesn't put a band-aid over a deeper problem and just says, oh, it's going to be okay now. I think what the gospel does and why it's powerful is it goes deep, in deeper than we could even imagine of how really, how sinful and how messed up our character really is. So today I want to unpack the idea of where Jesus is in our crisis, where, how the gospel saves us in crisis, and why crisis happens. So let's look at this passage. Let's go down. Now I could look here. The iPad. You gotta love Apple. You guys should buy some Apple stuff. It's good stuff, I'm telling you. I only endorse excellent products in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. So so look what happens here. Another rerun. Look into verse three. It says that. <clears throat> wow, this is, this is amazing. Okay, I'm going to stop coming. <laughs> but, but the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled. We heard this word before. They grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Verse 4, then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? Ever, anyone ever felt that? What am I going to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. What we see here in Exodus 17 is that the people of God are not getting better. They're getting worse. They're not getting more patient. They're getting least patient. Their true colors are showing. Their true character is showing. The purity and the integrity of their heart is showing. You know, you know when, I, when I read this part, what am, what am I supposed to do with these people? These people are about to stone me. These people, when I think one word of them, and I'm, I'm sure you, you know some people like this, including yourself. When I think of these people, there's only one word to describe them. It's impossible. You ever met impossible people before? They're just impossible. Impossible to talk to, because they won't let you talk. Impossible to change their mind. Impossible to lead. Sometimes I look at these people in this passage and I think they're just impossible to save. They're just impossible people. This word, what am I supposed to, this question, what am I supposed to do with these people I can really relate to? Or I can say, what am I supposed to do with this person I can relate to? Because this is like a revolt, you know? God, you have no idea what you're doing. Moses, you have no idea what you're doing. We're in this Crisis because it's your fault that you took us out and blaming. So it's impossible to lead them because of sin in their life, because of their true colors. And I feel like this with Nathan all the time. Sometimes I have to stop he's, and I have to say, Sam, he's three. You can't start punishing him yet. Because sometimes I think I'm going to have to literally lay the smack down for this kid to get it, because he thinks he's too cool. He thinks he's too smart. And it's annoying as heck sometimes. We go, and sometimes it's a, it's a little rebellion in the house. He takes my iPhone, it dies of battery, he takes my wife's iPhone, and he's, he's, you know, he's listening to his shows. And let me tell you, I hate three shows. Thomas, Thomas and Friends, I hate them. Like if you can hate anything, a bore. And, I abhor Thomas and Friends. Don't tell Nathan I said that, but I do. Charlie and Lo oh my gosh, this British show. I, sometimes I talk British now. Like seriously, you know, Charlie, I'm, it's just like, and, and the thing is, my, my son has a problem because he can't listen to the iPhone in a normal volume. He says he can't hear it. 
I'm not, that's impossible. He's impossible to deal with. And we go, Nathan, can you please? And, and did I say please? And I bought that iPhone. Or I took it from someone. And, um, you know, I'm like, come on. I'm like, uh, please lower the volume. He goes, okay, daddy. He lowers the volume for a second, pretends, and he raises it higher. And I go, Nathan. And I have to raise my voice. And I hate doing that. But I go, I go, Nathan, lower the volume or I will take that phone from you and you will never use it again. Psychologists has never used extreme language, but I don't think they, they have kids. <laughs> How could you not? That's a threat. And that is a rule. You, I mean, you, you're not going to do it, but you, you have to make the threat viable, right? And real. And he goes, and he puts the phone down. And you see the rebellion in this kid, and he's three. He comes to me, he goes, Daddy, why are you the boss? I'm like, because I'm, I'm, the, I'm Daddy, that's why. He goes, you're not the boss, I'm the boss. There can only be one boss. Why, you, why do you get to be the boss? I'm the boss. And this is not your phone, this is Mommy's phone. And I go, he's three. I'll wait to five. I'll wait to five. Um, when five happens, I'm counting the days down. But, I mean, how come? And he, in, innately in him, there's a biblical reality that he wants, to be the, he wants to be the boss because he wants to do what he wants to do. It doesn't matter how much we love him, how much we care for him, how much we put up with. He can't see that. He's impossible to lead. <laughs> I have to explain to him, I'm daddy, and I, I'm, the dad, I'm dad, I'm boss. He goes, but he doesn't understand why the dad is the boss. Because all he knows is when I'm the boss, he can't do what he wants, and he doesn't like that. It's a revolt. And you see, for him, that's a crisis. <laughs> when we take the iPhone away, the temperature rises. He's like, no way. That's what I need to live. I, it's a necessity for me, right? For some of us, our crisis is different. We're going through our own stuff in our life where our true colors show, where our true characters show. You see, crisis is an opportunity to see something that's very imperative for us to the, let, let the gospel really come deep in us. And this is the first lesson. So where is Jesus in our crisis? Well, simple. In our crisis, He's pointing to something. God let the whole community of the people of God into the desert, the desert of sin, so that our true colors could show. And because the truth is, he wants to show us what? How what? How impossible we are. Seriously. You and I are impossible. And I know some of you, impossible. Oh, Lord. You know when you cry out the name of the Lord, not worship? But it's, oh, Lord. The, only the God of the universe, only the God of the universe might have a chance, and it's not 100%, to deal with us. And in our crisis, our true colors show, our true characters show. All that sin. Sin is singular, people. Sin is taking our life into our hands rather than putting it into God's. Sin is singular, being in the epicenter of what I want and what I need, and not putting God in the epicenter, in the center of my life, and putting it into God's hands because God's smarter than I am. But no, we don't feel like that in crisis because all we see is the short game. We don't see the macro picture. We, picture, we, we see the micro picture, the problem, the crisis. And we go, well, if God was powerful, this wouldn't happen in the first place. I think I know better. That's sin. And it's in all of us. And when the temperature rises, it comes out. That's why we need to be saved, people. That's how we need to be saved. So where are the crises in your life today? Where your true colors show? Where you're not like nice and giddy, but you are impossible. Because really, what Nathan is saying is what we say to God. Why are you the boss? Why can't I be the boss? There could only be one boss. We know it, but we don't like that he's the boss. How many people like that God's the boss? You were like, sometimes. <laughs> Not always. That's when we talk about God ruining us, and we're like, oh, 
right? <laughs> Grumbling. Uh, now I have to do it. <laughs> I know it's the right thing, but it doesn't mean I like it. Why? Because God is still changing. The gospel is still saving. So you need to look into the life in your life. Look at, look at the areas of crisis. It shows you where you're at. And then you go, oh, that's why I need to be saved again. Every daily. That's why I need. Because no one else can put up with you. <laughs> no one can put up with us except a God that can do impossible things. I don't know if that's a compliment. That's not. Because <laughs> we're impossible. So the question then is, how do you help impossible people? Is that possible? How do you help people that are impossible to help, impossible to lead, impossible to save? Well, let's, and that's what the text stress next. Let's go down. So they're, right, they're, they're ready to stone him. And then God says, look at that, right here. He says, uh, go out in front of the people, take some of the elders of Israel, and take your hand and staff, and you got to pay attention to this, the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. So there's a foreshadowing there of a past miracle, where the Nile turned to blood, remember that? In the beginning of Exodus, where God's hands, in partnership with Moses, did something that was what? Impossible. So God says, take the staff as a symbol, as an altar of this situation. Yes, these people are impossible to lead. These people are impossibly annoying. But I'm about to do what? The impossible. Because that's who God is. He's the God of the impossible. Amen? That's the gospel. I love that. And so what he says, he says, um, I will stand before you by the rock at Horeb. And it says, strike the rock, and what? And the, and the water will come out for the people to drink. No, <laughs> guys. I'm a New Yorker at heart. I'm cynical at best. When I read this passage, I go, that's impossible. That's not impossible. It's not. I never got a rock. I'll get a rock right now. I'm going to strike it. Water better come out. Poland spring water. I mean, we should order rocks to our offices. I mean, come on. Be, how is that possible? That's not possible. It's, you're right. It's not possible. It's a miracle. And here, 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 Exodus, the motif of Exodus and the motif of the whole Bible points back to the reality that if impossible people are in danger of death, impossible people are in an impossible situation where they're facing something severe as not having water, in order for God to save them physically, he has to do a miracle. He has to do the impossible. But it points to a deeper reality that if you want to change the impossible, you need also an impossible person. Like the impossible person being a bad thing, and then you also need another impossible person that's better than them. Like for example, this is the question we're going to answer, okay? Now, think clearly about this. Why would you do something impossible? Go out of your way. Because it's a lot of work, right? Making water from a rock. It's a lot of energy. Why would you do that for impossible people? Who, who are people do, who do impossible things for just impossible people? I can tell you simply. People who are in love. Right? When, when um, someone is impossible to deal with, I mean, if you want to get married, let me just tell you right now. If you want to get married and you want to stay married, not married and divorced, that's two years. Okay? If you want to be married forever, you've got to be two impossible people. The person, whoever, the girl or the guy, I'm not sexist. One could run away, one has to chase. And back and forth. I'm telling you, fights after fights. 
World War One, World War Two, and Three, and Four. And you got to survive it because human beings are impossible. And so, if someone does something impossible, the other person has to do something more impossible, and they have to somehow two negatives make a positive, and you fall in love. And so, so let me let me. I just want to remind you. I mean, seriously, my wife, impossible. And you go, no, she's not. You don't know the way I know her. I remember even at school, right? When she, um, she dumped me. And I thought, I thought, this could be fun. After three days, I was like, this is not fun. This is hell. Because she was being impossible. She goes, get out of my face. I don't want to talk to you. I'm going to punch you. I'm going to punch you. You know, she basically, I'll knock your lights out, buddy. Back up. I'm like, wait, 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 I thought we were going to get married. She goes, where'd you get that, what, that idea? You know what I mean? Like, it was like, and then she would just completely ignore me in school. Cold. Impossible. She would just, and, and when she see me, she'd go, <laughs> <laughs> If you want to know, if you want to know where Nathan gets her, his sinful side from, definitely. Bring it. 100%. Seriously, I mean. Because, you know, Nathan would do this, and if I go, don't do that, he goes, hmm. That's where she gets from. It traces all the way back to college. That's the genealogy of hmm. I mean, and, and she would do that, and, and, you know, I thought, but you know what? She was being impossible. People were saying, dude, I think you should just let this one go. There are plenty of girls in the sea. I go, that's impossible. I want this one. So I planned it out. You know what I'm saying? And so, so I, I thought that this would do it. This, this would do it. Twelve long stem roses in her room. And I got all excited. Spent $100. You know how much $100 in in college? It's a lot. You know what I'm saying? And, and so I put it there, and I put it in the room. And so I put it there before she would come back from her class. All the roommates would help me, too. And then the roommates had like a AA meeting with me, like a, a you know, the prevention meeting. All of them, they got together and they said, sit down, Sam. And this is what they said. It's not you, it's her. She's being impossible. She is being impossible. I'm telling you, there's something wrong with her. I'm like, I know. But I think this, so I said, so, you know, how did the roses go? She threw it out. <laughs> But you see, if you want to move, why would I be putting myself in a train to be crushed when it's impossible? You see, when someone is being impossible, what makes love possible is when you go out to do <laughs> and dream of doing the impossible. That's what God's doing here. These people were impossible to save, to lead, but God is the God of impossibilities. I mean, if you have an infinite number of sinfulness in us, just like it keeps going down, gets worse, God, you see the motif of a father, his love. And you go, no, no, no one can have that kind of love. That's what? Impossible. They somehow, two negatives, make a positive. And then you get the cross. People say that God can't love people like that. God can't hope for people like that. God will give up sometimes. No, the cross points to the reality of another miracle. More than just a rock coming from water. A cross points to the ultimate heart of God. That says, I'm never giving up. How much, does God, how much does God love you? Right? This corny thing Christian people do. This much. But it's true. Because we're impossible, you need a God that makes the impossible possible. And that's the gospel. That's how powerful the gospel is. Because, trust me, none of us could change us. Because we're impossible, seriously. We forget easily. We're self-centered. 
We continually make it about us before others and God. Someone has to knock us out. Like I knocked my wife out and I won. <laughs> it's true. If someone is impossible, you got to be more impossible. Which makes it possible. And that's what God is. No matter how sinful or how lost or how crazy, broken we might be, there is no one that's more impossible or think more impossible than the love of God. That's why God saves people. That's the gospel. It's powerful. That's why it's, it's, it's open to everyone. It's powerful. So where is Jesus in our crisis? Well, the second thing we learned is that what? He wants us to what? To witness in our crisis. That what? He can make the what? Impossible possible. Yes, look at yourself. You know you can't change, but God can. God's love will prevail. Because let me tell you, there's no other reason, no other incentive. Econo basic economics. If you don't have an incentive, you don't do it. God's incentive is not really that great, except if, unless it's love. Today, turn our, let's turn our eyes back to Jesus. In spite of all the things that's going on in our life, that he saves us, he loves us. He will never leave us. And no matter what crisis happens in your life, crisis or the brokenness that happens in your life, he'll do the impossible, he'll save us again. Stand and pray together. Yeah, a couple announcements for you today. As we enter Christmas season, I think it's a great opportunity to share the gospel with people. Uh, especially if you never been to our website, we're still working on it. And the website, you know, I think people outside in the world actually check it out every day, uh, all over the world. Uh, I think it's time, though, that a lot of us use the website as a form of a beginning uh, stage of sharing our faith with our friends and family. Uh, well, the website, it's a great place to go. I mean, as soon as you go in, you see photo booth, you see many other things. So one of the things I want to say today, encourage you, it, it, during Christmas, sow the seed in people's lives by, I don't know, sharing a website or send them a message. Because our messages on, on HD, it's, you know, it's pretty cool. And, you know, the speaker isn't so bad. So I, I'm serious. I know people that have come to 180 and also from around the world. I get emails all the time from Shanghai, from Paris, from London, that hear, hear the message of the gospel and respond. And I think one of the things that we can do as the beginning indicator, before they, they don't even have to come to service yet, is to give a message. Send them a message on YouTube. Or send them the email you get from, from 180. And let them listen. Because hey, just check this out. Just check this out. It isn't so bad. And I think when people engage with, with the message of the gospel, People begin, I mean, they don't even know what's going on when they hear it. But people change. Um, I mean, God is leading so many people to Christ. I mean, it's pretty amazing this year. This year has been fascinating. I mean, three more people came to Christ last night. You know, right? Praise God. And they were coming for a while. Well, two people just came and they, they accepted Christ. So that, that's like a bonus. <laughs> Christmas bonus. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, seriously, I, I want to encourage you to check out the website. Use it. A lot of things went into it. Use it as a tool to share with people the gospel. Not just for Christmas, just for, 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 you know, every month. I think that, um, I believe 2011, if we had about 110 people that come to Christ, I think 2011, it's, it's going to make that look pathetic. And you go, is that possible? God's an impossible God. That's the gospel. So I encourage you to do that and pray over it. Send people messages. Engage sharing our faith so I think one of the things that we're going to send out in the end of December is for people that give we're going to give you an annual report of uh, all the monies that we received throughout the year and you're going to see where it goes to um, you're going to see that even this year there's definitely a shortfall in 188 got me covered the rest but you'll see that it's going up so I was like I was telling her I was like did it go up Finally, 
you know? And then we believe next year, you know, it could even go up more. I think one of the things that people that come to Christ, when we started 180, one of the, one of the most amazing things is that God has always provided somehow for us to do mission, to spread the message of the gospel. Even the city was a big stretch, you know? And um, I want you to think about that as you read the annual report for those of you who give. I want you to know something. Forget about money. Forget about all that. When you see the number of people that have found Christ, the number of people that are hearing the message of the gospel, I pray that you be motivated to be faithful to give and give more. Not because, you know, oh, well, I got you know, to tithe because it's what Malachi 3 says, but you're becoming the church and you're loving it. Because the Bible says that he loves a generous giver. And let me just tell you something. Hey, you can't outgive God. And I know, I know this is like, people hear this all the time. You can't out, What does that mean? You can't, you can't outgive God. If you give, God gives more. So you can give more. Not so you can spend more. Okay? So it's a missional life. So th- these are two things that, that are in my heart that I want to pray for today. And um, really ask God to convict us during the end of the year. To align. So that 180 could continue to go strong in 2011. Like it's been. So let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you that uh, you've given us the internet. We didn't have that in high school. I didn't have that in high school. I wish I did. You've given us Google and Apple. And I'm not endorsing any stocks here. But I'm just (laughs) praying for the advancement of technology that you've given us. Lord, it's amazing that people can hear the gospel before they even come to the service because we can send it to them. So Lord, we want to pray that every video that we send to our friends this season is the best we can give them to hear the gospel and the good news. We pray that you'll start moving in their life. They'll start finding their ways here to find you and be in the family of God. And Lord, we want to lastly pray about the giving, the finances in our life. Father, I know that many of us are divided in that place, still struggle. And tithing, yes, is biblical, but more than that, I pray, Father, that we would begin to see a big picture of what you're doing, what our purpose is here. And we pray, Father, to be motivated to give generously and become the church and not the crowd. So that we can see so many more people come to Christ and we can continue to give and build the house of the Lord. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.